All right, guys, good morning. Monday morning. Uh, it is March 23rd. Uh, I'm going to do it this way today again. Um, I'll do some morals, morals. I'll do a little bit of background uh, for the next assignment. Uh, this week, I am actually hoping to do maybe Wednesday or Thursday um, to do a Zoom class. Uh, hopefully, I can get that code out to you guys. You guys can get on. We'll do a lecture or something. I got some slides I want to show you guys. And again, I'm going to do the best I can, but there might be some glitches. That's always going to happen. So I'll do the best to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I want everyone to situate right now. And uh, I'll read top five picks and give you a little background here. Uh, first one I have for today is uh, host a backyard get-together for friends and neighbors every Labor Day. Uh, I would throw in the Memorial Day and Fourth of July also. It's just good to have people around to celebrate the good things in, in life. And I think we would all agree right now that celebrating the good things in life is a very important thing to do. So let's make sure we're doing that. Next one says keep $10 in your glove box for emergencies. Uh, maybe have it hidden somewhere, but it's good to have some cash just in case you need uh, to uh, get something uh, when you're out on the road. So make sure you have some cash available to you. Okay. Uh, next one says... Never be too busy to meet someone new. Be open to new people. Be open to new ideas. Um, they might change your life. You never know. It's kind of a good thing to do. Uh, if it's not a beautiful morning, let your cheerfulness make it one. Okay. Try to make everyone's day a better day. Uh, and again, focusing on the times right now with the un, you know, people kind of nervous about things. Uh, we could be the good thing in life. We could be the thing that makes people um, feel good and feel positive. So be that person. Okay. And then the last one I have for today is remember that cruel words deeply hurt, okay? Uh, don't say them. Just bottom line, don't say them. And then if you do, don't give us this, um, well, I didn't mean it. It's out there. It's already done, okay? Uh, we talked about how people always apologize once they get caught saying something. They're apologizing because they got caught saying something. So if something good doesn't go in the head, then just don't say it, okay? All right, a little bit of a recap. Okay, we talked uh, about the Battle of Gettysburg uh, the other day. Uh, you guys hopefully have seen the um, Gettysburg uh, map um, video. I don't know. I hope you guys have seen it. I know some of you guys were saying you couldn't. Uh, I don't know what the issue is there. I did put an email that you guys could get on to. It's the IT people of uh, the school district. Maybe you can ask them what's going on. But if some people are getting it, I'm assuming... Everybody should be able to get it unless there's uh, something going on on your end where you're not uh, you're blocked from certain things. Uh, just do your best to try to get to that because that assignment is due tomorrow along with 17-1 and 17-2 questions. Um, a lot of you guys have already turned those in. Uh, if you notice, I put the Gettysburg rewrite assignment on the grade book. It's already been done. Uh, I have a lot of people in some periods who just haven't checked in. They're not doing anything. Wake up. Let's go. You got to get moving. Let's go. Okay. A uh, little background. So we talked about uh, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of uh, 1863 is going to be the bloodiest war in American history. It's the bloodiest war of the Civil War. Uh, we've got um, General Meade uh, is the new commander of the Army of the Potomac, so the Northern Army. Uh, and you've got Lee who's decided he's going to attack into Northern Territory, into Pennsylvania. He's got about 75,000 men. Uh, and these two armies are going to collide with each other in a pretty insignificant town of Gettysburg. Gettysburg is just a small, sleepy farm town. It wasn't like this was uh, something that they circled saying, let's do battle here. Both armies just happened to collide here. And then they had to adjust and adapt to that town for their needs. So this Battle of Gettysburg... Um, on day one, we talked about uh, how uh, initially the numbers were still coming in on both sides, but two small groups of Union uh, cavalry, and then we had some Confederate uh, infantry who had come in, uh, and they um, met each other quite accidentally. And in this meeting, you're going to start to see um, some pretty heavy fighting taking place. And they were on the outskirts of Gettysburg, outskirts of town, and the Confederates started pushing the Union soldiers, the cavalry, back through town. When this battle was going on through town, it got ugly. There was one citizen 
uh, who lived in Gettysburg who will die during this three-day battle. Only one. This poor lady's name was Ginny Wade, and she was in the kitchen making bread for some soldiers when a stray bullet went through her door and hit her in the back and killed her uh, through the heart, and she died instantly. She'll be the only citizen to die um, during the Battle of Gettysburg, but it shows kind of how fierce that fighting is going through town. So after day one, the Union was pushed back through town, and they entrenched themselves on some high ground. And we talked about how that high ground uh, was the shape of a fish hook. Okay? And if you remember, like a fish hook might look like something like this, or it goes like this here. And you've got uh, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and the little round top kind of over here. So that's kind of what we're looking at right there. Okay, So they're encamped on that high ground. And the Confederates missed a golden opportunity to push the Union off of that high ground on that first day. And had they done that, this battle would have gone much differently. But they fail to push them off that high ground. So day two, now the Confederates have to spend some time, resources, and manpower to try to get them off that high ground. And that is not going to go well, as we all know. On that second day, here's that fish hook. Okay, The Confederates are going to concentrate in two areas, Little Round Top over here and Culp's Hill over here. Okay, and they're going to um, concentrate trying to outflank or get around the Union Army on both of those sides right there. Because if you can get around that Union Army and outflank them, you cut that army off from one, escape to Washington, D.C., but you also cut the army off from each other, and that's kind of what they're trying to do. You cut that army off from escape routes, and you cut that army off from one another, it creates chaos, and more than likely, that battle ends differently. But the problem is they can't budge them. They can't get them off of those flanks. Okay, That high ground is just too difficult. Uh, we talked about how one of the key uh, moments was over here at Little Round Top. Um, you've got the Confederates going up that hill to try to dislodge that Union army there so they can outflank them. Um, and one of the key uh, reasons this happens is we talked about Dan Sickles right here at Cemetery Ridge. He moved his army off of that ridge into the peach orchard here. Uh, he took matters into his own hands and it almost screws up the whole Union army. Well, Karma's going to come back and bite him in the butt because what happens is later on in that day, um, a Confederate shell bursts right near him, blows his leg off. He loses his leg. Um, and as he's being lifted off of the battlefield, uh, he's got a cigar in his mouth, his leg's off, and he's shouting orders to everyone as what to do. It's total chaos. So it was luckily that uh, Colonel Chamberlain over here with the 20th Maine was able to, was able to stop Confederates from outflanking them. But it wasn't easy. Uh, they started losing ammunition, and as the Confederates are charging up a number of times, on that last time they came up that hill, um, Chamberlain had to order a bayonet charge. So literally what had to happen, because they were out of bullets, is they had to put the bayonet, that sharp blade, at the end of their, their rifle. And as the Confederates were coming up the hill, the Union soldiers ran down the hill and charged at them with that bayonet. Uh, and it ends up saving the day. So day two... Confederates cannot outflank the two flanks here, which means um, Lee has got he's got a, a decision to make. Either he gets out because it's not succeeding, or he's going to try to win this battle no matter the, the circumstances, and that's exactly what he tries to do. So day three, we talked about um, uh, his desperate attempt. Now he's going to attack the center line, okay, at Cemetery Ridge. Uh, in order to do that, he tries to soften up that center a little bit by um, bombing them with cannons. He just let op opens up on them. The Union opens back, and there's just this barrage of cannon going back and forth. It's heard 40 miles away at Harrisburg. Uh, and then at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, out come the Confederates from a tree line, and they are marching one mile over open farmland at a uh, kind of a slight incline towards the center of the Union Army. And as this Confederate army comes out 13,000 strong under George Pickett, it's called Pickett's Charge, but it was really under a number of people, but the popular name is going to be Pickett's Charge. Um, the Union cannons start opening up, and it just devastates them, devastates them. The Confederates, some of them, a lot of them actually, get up to that line where the Union are holding at Cemetery Ridge here, and you're going to get some intense hand-to-hand um, -hand combat and ultimately what's going to happen is the Confederates are going to be pushed back. And the day will be won 
by the Union. The battle will be won by the Union. And Pickett basically, like I said before, says to Lee, uh, I can't reorganize my men uh, in case they counter because I have no men left. And that's basically what he says. Okay. Um, so let me give you a little bit of uh, uh, July 4th information. Uh, Lee does decide to leave. Uh, and in his wake, as he leaves, um, the town of Gettysburg is never going to be the same again. This town has been turned completely upside down. Uh, you've got uh, horses, animals, dead bodies all over the place. And they outnumber the citizens. I don't want to give too much away in case you guys haven't seen the video yet. But they outnumber the citizens of Gettysburg by a huge ratio. Okay, And uh, these people in this town now are left to clean up this mess. Houses have been turned into hospitals. Barns have been turned into hospitals. Businesses have been turned into hospitals. Doors were taken off of door jams and laid on the ground as beds. You had blood splattered on people's walls. You had cannonballs lodged in people's walls outside their house. It was just um, chaos, total chaos. So as these armies left, these people in Gettysburg had to dig these graves, these mass graves for animals and for human beings. Uh, and they would dig them, and they weren't very deep graves. They were actually pretty shallow graves. So over the course of July and into August, these heavy summer rains would come to Gettysburg and would wash that topsoil away. It would start flooding out these muds. And all of a sudden, you would see arms coming up out of the ground or legs coming up out of the ground and limbs coming up out of the ground. And for months, all you could smell was death at Gettysburg. That's going to be the scene on November 19th of 1863. On November 19th of 1863, Abraham Lincoln shows up to Gettysburg to dedicate a, a cemetery for Union soldiers. Okay, And in this dedication, he wants to uh, make sure he gives just due to these soldiers that gave their lives, these Union soldiers. But even in November of 1863, it still smells like death there. There are still carcasses all over the place. The town is still trying to put itself back together. So the scene hasn't changed that much when Lincoln arrives uh, for November 19th, 1863. At this dedication, the first guy that's, that spoke was a guy named Edward Everett. Edward Everett was one of the great orders of the day. He was a politician. He stands up for two hours and he gives this speech. Um, and for two hours, uh, he gives a great speech. And then after he speaks... Lincoln stands up, and he gives his two-minute speech, the Gettysburg Address. We all know it by now, uh, and that's something I'm going to show you guys with the next assignment. But this two-minute speech, after he delivers it, he kind of sits down, and he's thinking to himself, that, that's not going to wash. He, I mean, he actually tells a, a colleague next to him, he goes, you know, that, that speech isn't going, it's not going to resonate very well. Uh, he wasn't impressed with what he did at all. And here we are, what, 200 and... What, how, how, 157 years later, sorry, 157 years later, and we are talking about this being one of the greatest speeches in American history. So it did wash. It most definitely did because in, uh, as Edward Everett told him, Mr. Lincoln, you said in two minutes what I could not convey in two hours. So it might have been short, but it was to the point. It was precise. It touched Americans, uh, and here we are still talking about it today. So your next assignment, um, I'm, I'm hoping this works. I'm going to give you a link to a YouTube video, and we are going to show something from Ken Burns' Civil War series. It's done by PBS, and you can find it anywhere. Um, you can go on YouTube if, if you can't find it on my link. Um, it's all over the place. And you're going to go to the segment that says uh, Gettysburg Address, okay? And there's about a five, six-minute video. It uh, talks about some background information, and then someone, an actor, comes on portraying Lincoln and gives the Gettysburg Address. And one of the great scenes that you'll see here is the picture of Lincoln uh, giving the Gettysburg Address. You could barely see him because the photographer was preparing the camera, thinking Lincoln was going to be up there for at least an hour speaking. So he's slowly preparing the camera to take a picture of Lincoln. And sure enough, two minutes later, the speech ends and the, the camera, the photographer's going, oh, I better get this picture. And he snaps it. You can see Lincoln sitting down and it's kind of blurry because the cameras back then didn't capture things very well. So it's just a, a great picture to see because it shows you really how quickly that Gettysburg Address went. If I can give you guys any advice at all, 
Uh, one of the greatest things you could do is to go visit the Battle of Gettysburg site in, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It is humbling. It is amazing. It is one of the most beautiful places you will see. And to hear the stories about what went on there, uh, I would love to be in class with you guys so I can kind of do some more with this. But um, it gives you the chills. And I think I mentioned to you guys before, uh, the first time I ever went to uh, the Battle of Gettysburg battlefield, uh, we were there and I was sitting on Cemetery Ridge looking out over this farmland where you would have seen Pickett coming up 13,000 strong. I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I couldn't budge. I got chills. Uh, I had to have uh, one of the other teachers on the trip with me, uh, Mrs. Syke. She had to come up. They were all on the bus, loaded, ready to go to the next thing. She had to come up, get out of the bus, and come kind of tap me on the shoulder and say, I'm sorry, it's time to go. But that's how moving this is. Um, and if you're a history nerd like I am, it, it's one of the greatest things that you'll see. So please go. Uh, you also uh, want to go to the cemetery uh, where Lincoln dedicated um, the cemetery to the Union soldiers. It is way worth going to. So again, uh, that's some background. I've got an assignment coming up for you guys here pretty soon. Uh, and I will post that for you guys. Uh, have a great day. I miss you guys all. And... Clean up!